launch with Adobe. Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. My name is Adam Pratt, and I work on the Creative Cloud for Enterprise team at Adobe. And I have some guests with me today for this IT roundtable. Uh, we're glad you joined us. Uh, and I just have a few notes that I want to review as we get started. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is this is the first of a new series of uh, virtual Enterprise tools. So uh, we're glad you joined us today and hope you'll join us in the future. Uh, today, we're going to cover some basic topics just about uh, deployment and some changes in terms of licensing and serial numbers and things like that. Uh, in the future, we plan to cover topics including uh, kind of more detailed deployment best practices, security topics, and so on. So we're glad you're here and we hope you can stay tuned uh, in the future for uh, further installments, hopefully on a monthly basis. Um, a couple things uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, is that uh, uh, today's topic is really focused on the IT audience. Um, and so hopefully that is a good fit for you. That's your uh, kind of slice of the world. And uh, that's where we'll focus today. Um, the, um, the, I think where we want to start is just a little bit of context. So uh, I've been in Adobe a long time, about 18 years actually. And through that time, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, over the last several years, we've had a lot of changes in our uh, Creative Cloud tools, so specifically in 2012, so rewinding uh, about six years, we shipped the first version of Creative Cloud for Enterprise. So we were uh, kind of a big milestone event for Adobe. Um, and I'm gonna look at my cheat sheet here to remember the date. So that was 2012. And in 2014, we shipped the first version of the Adobe Admin Console that just helped it uh, be easier to manage licenses. Um, within uh, that product offering. And then over the last, uh, next couple of years, 2015 and on, we added support for things like single sign-on, uh, easier deployment, things like that, just trying to make life easier for the IT admins out there who are managing uh, the software within the enterprise. Uh, so that's just a little bit about where we've been, uh, but it also points us forward. So we've got a few key changes coming up for the future that we want you to know about and be ready for, and that's uh, part of the motivation for having this session. Uh, two key dates are October 2018. That's going to be our next MAX conference. If you're not familiar with it, that's our annual creativity conference. And at that point, we always have lots of exciting new releases to our Creative Cloud applications. And that's going to be the first version of Creative Cloud uh, in the enterprise that requires named user licensing. Uh, so we've been through this transition for several years. Several customers have already made that transition. But if you haven't yet, this is the time. Because if you want to take advantage of those new apps and features, you'll need to be on uh, named user licensing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And moved on from uh, traditional serial numbers, which we're familiar with, but have some limitations. Uh, the other thing that you've noticed all along at Adobe is that new apps, uh, applications such as uh, Adobe XD and Adobe Dimension, we actually don't support serial numbers in those applications anymore because we're moving forward. Uh, so we're not putting that old technology in there anymore. So that's going to be a key pivot point, a uh, key milestone. And so we want you to be aware of that. And uh, in the session today, we want to help you understand uh, more of why we're making these changes and how Adobe can help you get there. So with that, uh, I want to transition. And um, uh, I'm not the only one here. I, I have a guest, uh, group of guests with me. Uh, so Rick Borstein with Adobe, Kevin Solmeyer uh, is uh, with Uline, a customer, and James Lockman, uh, also with Adobe. Why don't you guys uh, just give yourselves a brief intro and tell us what you do and why you're here. Okay, thanks, Adam. My name is Rick Borstein. I manage Adobe's uh, digital media solution consulting team for North America. I'm based here in Chicago, and I've been with Adobe 24 years. And uh, what my team does is we work with our larger customers to help them get the value out of their product, understand what they're buying. And a lot of the work that we're doing right now is help our customers move to name user licensing, which is the direction we're going. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, these new applications are really built for the cloud and have a lot of value in the cloud. And you know, just a few years ago, we had maybe 15 creative apps and now we have like 56 products and services. So whole new world, three times more stuff. So uh, we're, uh, my team helps people understand what they're buying and get the most out of it. Yeah. And so the thought of managing all those serial numbers across dozens of products across hundreds or thousands of users start to sound kind of crazy. So yeah, we're trying to make that easier. Does, yeah. Cool. Kevin. So I'm Kevin Sawyer. I'm the director of creative technical services for Uline. We're a shipping supply company based out of Poison Prairie, Wisconsin. 
Um, I've been there for about three years. Prior to that, I was an educator. I've worked a lot with Adobe. I've worked with Adobe for a number of years um, through lynda.com and, and other avenues. Um, so we're a enterprise customer with Adobe services. So uh, that's where we're coming from. Cool. Glad you're here. Thank you. I'm James Lockman. I manage the digital media uh, services team, consulting team here in, in the Americas. I'm based in Maine. Most of my team is in New York. Um, we have a couple of different functions. One of those is security reviews. So um, when Rick's team is working with customers to make them or help them to be comfortable with our named user licensing model, oftentimes there's security uh, moments that happens and my team will help resolve that uh, any questions the customer may have. We also work with customers who are looking to automate their um, connection between their directory system, their user management system inside of their organization with Adobe's user management system to streamline the deployment of licenses to those users in the organization. We'll talk some more about that a little bit later on. Excellent. Super. Well, thank you guys all for being here. Um, I love to talk, but I don't have to do all the talking. So Rick, <laughs> I'm going to hand it off to you because you know Kevin really well. You've been involved with them as a customer. Mm -hmm. um, so give us a little backstory about your engagement there and uh, how that went. Okay. Well, th thanks, Adam. So first of all, Kevin, thanks for being here today. I think it's always great to hear from customers. And, um, you know, we're here in Chicago. This is the Midwest. And, you know, what we're talking about here today really is change, right? Mm -hmm. We're asking our customers to do something different. Back in the day, you got a box with a CD and a serial number, and you made an install, or you pushed out to your end users, and you really didn't think about it very much for sometimes years. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we're asking customers to use a new sort of licensing technology called name user licensing. And that means change for IT organizations. So we meet with customers like you, Kevin, and you know, help you through that process. So um, before we kind of, we talk more about the process, why don't you tell us a little about Uline and what your company does? Sure. I mean, I get your giant catalog, so I know, <laughs> but what about everyone else? So Uline is one of North America's largest suppliers for shipping supplies, uh, material handling, janitorial supplies. Um, we do a whole plethora of retail, things like that. The catalog is the main marketing tool that we have, but we also have a large e-commerce presence. Um, we do a lot of direct mail marketing. Um, we've gotten into social media recently. Um, so all of that is is kind of our, our core business is the shipping supplies boxes. Right. Everyone knows us for that. Um, tape. Tape. <laughs> <laughs> Pallet jacks. Pallet jacks. Buckets. Yep. Buckets. Yeah, you yep. got it. You, we, you, you need it, we have it. And yep. you guys are privately held. We're privately held. Um, we're located, like I said, in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Um, small Midwestern conservative values, um, but we're also an enterprise customer for Adobe. Okay, and so one of the reasons I, I like that you're here is we talk about change in IT, and not every company is a giant California-based IT culture, <laughs> you know, with thousands of IT people and unlimited budget to do this sort of stuff. I thought it'd be great, Adam, to get Kevin here to represent the Midwest, a conservative company, and the, the, the challenges that you might face mm -hmm. and how you got through them. So, you know, thanks for being here today. So um, let's talk about you a little bit. You know, I've known you for a number of years. I know you've got a good background in our tools. So why did you, how did you, what was your story uh, getting to Uline and what did they want you to do there? So my background uh, is I started off as a graphic designer. Um, that's how I got to know Adobe as a company and using their products uh, and transitioned over into education. So I was a college educator for nine years, um, got to know the company a little bit further and then transitioned into uh, corporate education and training. And that's when I started to work with Adobe, um, got, to, got to know a little bit more about the back end and, and how things work. Um, so I did that for a number of years, uh, did the lecture circuit, did a lot of conferences and stuff. So when, when I, was at a crossroads and had a choice of what I wanted to do with my life. And, and Uline had approached me and, and very happily I accepted. So they brought me on board to help with their creative department, which is a very large creative department for the company. It's over a hundred people. Um, I, our, my department creative tech uh, really isn't tech IT. We bridge the gap between creative and our IT department. So we, we have one foot in creative, one foot in IT, and we kind of help with communication and with administration. Um, for hardware and software deployments, things like that. Um, my uh, purview when I came in was uh, to help with training. We made the jump when I got there from CS5 to Creative Cloud. So that was a very large jump for software implementation and training for users. And then also the other side was uh, we we're also an Adobe Experience Manager customer with assets. So I came on board to kind of help with the, the ramp up for that.
Okay, great. So, um, so you just talked about this transition you made mm -hmm. from CS5, the old serial numbers, mm -hmm. uh, package up, IT buy, you know, yep. I'll see you in two or three years. And then you moved to CC 2014 and then you went to name user licensing there too. Correct. So kind of tell me about, um, and I was involved with some of this, yes. but <laughs> I was there, but what were some of the challenges that you had around, you know, deployment or security or some of the conversations you had to have internally? Sure. So there's, we had a lot of meetings, as, as you know, you were involved with some of them. Um, security was a big concern for ours. We have a lot of proprietary information that we like to keep in-house, especially when it comes to marketing. We don't want to have stuff leaked out before launch mm -hmm. or when a catalog comes out. So we're, we're kind of uh, concerned about that. So one of the things that we took a hard look at is uh, cloud sharing um, and the aspects of that when it came to implementing a creative cloud uh, application. So thankfully we worked through with the team at Adobe and our IT security to find a way to limit um, creative, creative cloud file sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so the file storage we actually have turned off, but we still use it for things like Typekit and libraries. So we still get some of the, the advantages of having creative cloud without having the, the security issues that you would have with a normal uh, individual license. Okay, so you're just keeping those files on your local file server for now. Um, so what are your people doing with some of these services? For example, libraries, how is that helping you? Um, so libraries was actually a huge advantage for us. We, we use it primarily for team sharing. So um, one thing that we use uh, on almost an everyday basis, we have a master library of colors that we use at Elon, and we're able to share that with all of our users and manage it from one account. So if a, a color change, like we recently had an update to a PMS color, we're able to update that in the library. Everybody has live access mm -hmm. to that. Um, the other thing that another team does is they do some of our instructional materials where they have the same kinds of iconography or um, tools and things that they use in exploded diagrams and things. So they've added that to a library that they can share amongst the team. Again, live update, administration, um, and just manage that from one location, which is great. So they can share all that between the teams. Yeah. So, in, so in a situation like that, I hear what you're saying is they're on brand, like mm -hmm. so they're all synced instantly and consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably also saving them time because I know we've all like had to navigate to a Correct. file server to find a logo and it oh, stinks. God. 17 yep. levels deep. Right. <laughs> right. And, and so I, I just call that out because we look at this technology change and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I got to do something new. And that's true in terms of the deployment and the licensing. Um, but there's a payoff, like there's yes. a benefit that says we go through this transition, but by transitioning this to a cloud-based license, the users get access to new tools and workflows that make a difference for them too. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Yeah. So kind of what was kind of the IT landscape there before as far as deployment and what kind of advantages have you seen since you moved to named user licensing? So prior to named uh, licensing, what we had was uh, individual deployments. So we had the serialized licensing, especially for Acrobat. Um, one of the things that, uh, from an IT perspective that we found a benefit from was when we did an audit, we were able to gather everything, unite everyone under one contract, but also for managing deployment, everyone's under one uh, console now, mm -hmm. where before individual teams, when we started doing audit, we found, oh, this team had purchased Acrobat on their own, or this team had purchased something else, um, bypassing IT, basically. So now IT is able to manage that completely in-house from an admin console, uh, for deployment and for managing users, which is a huge win for us. So that consolidation, sorry, like I'm just thinking yeah. that that gives you um, more buying power. Like you're mm -hmm. going to get a better price because you're buying in volume. Right. You're going to have more centralized management. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking it also leaves you less paranoid because yeah. you actually know what's going on and yeah. you don't have all these like kind of like rogue situations. Is that exactly. It? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's I, IT uh, has really benefited from that. Okay. Cool. So I wanted to touch on um, kind of the services again. So mm -hmm. are you using our admin console in a way to limit or which services certain users get? Yeah, we're we're actually using the admin console for, for three main things right now. Um, we're using it for Creative Cloud Complete. So we have users that are in that group, but we also have our creative department that has access to Typekit. So if we have a special project or something that they're working on where they want to fancy your fonts, something outside of the normal brand, mm -hmm. um, they have access to that. But the rest of the company, we have that access turned off. Um, and then we also have Acrobat. So we have uh, Acrobat deployments that we can send out to users. And again, the nice thing about the admin console is that as people transition between teams, we can change permissions or we can limit access or add grant access to different applications or deployment packages. 
Well, cool. So um, something else I wanted to ask you, we, we touched about security, mm -hmm. just going to throw it out there. Sure. Security is always at top of mind concern for everybody, <laughs> but especially in the Midwest, right? Where we're, some of these are newer ideas to us here, the cloud. Um, so it, we recently came out with a, a feature called, um, called uh, asset settings. And mm -hmm. what it allows you to do is limit, you know, sharing to within your own domain, your own people right. or to designated domains. Is that something you've looked at? Uh, we've looked at it. Um, we haven't implemented it yet, but IT is looking at it and our IT security is looking at it as an option. Um, it's newer for us. The, the original thought still kind of holds true. We want to kind of turn that off when mm -hmm. necessary. Um, but as far as sharing with outside vendors, if there is a need, then we can validate that at the time. Okay, got it. And so what's, what's next for you guys? Um, next for us uh, is actually uh, transitioning from standard name user licensing to single sign-up. Okay. Um, there's a couple benefits for us with that. One is right now standard uh, naming licensing. We're manually adding and removing users. So an IT could go, say if it goes through for someone that's transitioning or leaving your company, IT has to go into the admin console and remove that person. Mm -hmm. With uh, syncing up with our Active Directory and SSO, that could be automatically synced. So we could have a user switch, transition, or roll off and have that automatically be handled. Yeah, the, the, the SP-based directory is a newer service yep. that, that you run. Okay. And um, that's interesting. So I want to go back to um, kind of having a central contract mm -hmm. with Adobe instead of buying an ad hoc. What, what, what's been the value there for you guys? Um, savings. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> there, Adam, Adam hit the nail on the head. Okay. Uh, having volume licensing like that definitely helps with pricing. Um, but it also helps us as far as... Uh, not necessarily from the contract side, but again, it's having everyone united under one roof. We can keep tabs on everything a lot easier where we're not kind of blindsided by, oh, when we go in and true up our contract in three years, we suddenly have 50 more Acrobat users than we were aware of. We have full knowledge of what's going yeah. on with the deployments and the, and the company. So, so the admin console is sort of like your source of truth. Right. Great. That's super. Anything else you want to share? Um, no, we've been really happy with our relationship. Uh, with Adobe, it's been going on, like I said, for a number of years, even before I came on board, uh, you only had a relationship with Adobe. Yeah. Um, and we're looking forward to the next release. All right, well, thanks, Kevin. You know, and again, just a shout out to my, my peeps in Midwest here. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes change comes a little slowly to us, but we can do it and anybody can do it, I think. So yeah, absolutely. I'll throw it back to you, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kevin, one thing I want to call out that I think is interesting was you talked about it sounded like you guys were on the enterprise IDs. Mm -hmm. Is that, so it, we yep. support three different identity types. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, you guys were started on enterprise ID, which is a fine place to start. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I call it out because um, the majority of our customers are using single sign-on or federated ID. Right. And if customers have that in place, that's fine. It's a, you know, it's a great option. Uh, but if you don't, I think it's worth calling out that that's not a requirement, right? So right. if you're listening to this going, well, we don't have SSO, we're, we're not there yet, or we use it on a limited basis, that's fine. You can get right. going. And then just like you guys, when the time's right, when you're ready for it, either in terms of bandwidth or, uh, you know, policies or whatever, whatever you can transition. Yeah. So, and that's what you guys are about to do. Yeah, it's our right. choice. Yeah, to, yeah. to move up. It, it automates a lot of things for us. We see a lot of benefits using that. The yeah. enterprise idea is a good place to start because it allows you to set your password policies and cycling and complexity. Yeah. And it's a good place to start if you don't have SSO at all or if you don't have the resources to implement right away. Right. Okay, good. Well, thanks. That was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Kevin, you did this for your company. James, you did this for lots of organizations. Lots of organizations. So, <laughs> let's start. Tell us a little bit about the team that you run and what do you guys do? Sure. We've got, as I mentioned before, we have kind of two sides of the team. Um, the largest portion of our team are implementation groups. So, I've got a program manager, they've got a developer, some few people that go with them work with customers to help activate the connection between a uh, directory system to an active directory, open directory, something LDAP compliant, mm -hmm. and the Adobe admin console. And the idea here is that we want our IT partners to be working in one place as the source of truth, not only for whether a user is in the organization, but also whether that user has access to a product or service that lives in the Adobe um, cloud clouds, mm -hmm. multiple clouds. Um, and our customers vary. We have customers who are in, uh, you know, corporate, I don't want to say general corporate, but, you know, like Uline that are, um, their businesses, they're making stuff. Yeah. That's great. 
we also have customers in financial services. We have a lot of customers in education. Yep. We have some government customers that we work with and yep. defense. So we're, we're across the board. Um, and while I manage a team in Americas, mm -hmm. there's also a team in EMEA in, in Europe and the Middle East. We have a team in Japan. We have a team in um, Asia Pacific, which is a colossal region, but you yep. know, they're working with their customers. So our, our, Motion is global, mm -hmm. and we're working around the world to help customers activate that connection. Yeah. We bring software to the table. Um, we have a thing called the User Sync tool. It takes advantage of a capability of the Adobe Admin Console called the User Management API. So you'll hear UMAPI sometimes in conversation with some of the Adobe people. That's the User Management API. It's well documented at Adobe I.O. So go and take a look at that if you haven't looked at it. Um, and with the user management API, you can build an application on your side that can talk to the Adobe user management system and do things like add users or add entitlements to uh, or put a user into a specific group or attach them to a product profile, right? You can do that. Yep. What we've done with the user sync tool <coughs> is turn that into a turnkey solution that you can install in your data center you can then configure it to talk to your LDAP and to the admin console and tell it what means what. So if I have a, an LDAP security group on one side, what group does it align with in the Adobe admin console side? And then once that's turned on, it will continually run to ensure that the users that are in LDAP align with the user configurations over on the Adobe admin console side. It applies to the creative cloud. We've been talking about that mm -hmm. today and the document cloud, which we've also been talking about. Yep. But it also works with products like Adobe Stock, works with products like uh, Adobe Target and Analytics and the rest of the marketing cloud that's product. So it's a broad don't for, region. Don't forget, we also just added Presenter and Captivate. And presenter and Captivate so, can now so. be entitled that. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I think that's interesting because what I, what I hear from you is two things. One is um, you're dealing with customers across the board, lots of different industries, commercial government, education, yes. like kind of more like high security environments like banks and things like that. Um, but then, so you're, you're across a lot of different organizations, um, but then the Adobe admin console, and we call it that on purpose. It's not like the creative cloud console. Right. It's the Adobe admin console that lets you manage the licenses and users across all of those. So from one place, IT gets a nice overview, one footprint. Um, that's great. Yeah, a lot of our customers love the fact that, or actually they, they come to a realization where previously with deploying with serial numbers, they realize that there's a there's a risk there yeah. because if you have a package that you built with an embedded serial number, your employee could potentially take that home. Thumb right? drive, where does that, that go? Be that. <laughs> right. um, with named user licensing, we're attaching a license to a known user. Mm -hmm. And that way, IT doesn't have to manage those deployment packages in the way that they used to or worry that a deployment package might get out into the wild. Right. So what if it does? It doesn't matter. The right. end user, if they turn on Photoshop, it's still going to say, sign in. And if they don't have their Uline credentials, guess what? They're not going to be able to use the software. So IT is protected. And we, you can see the light bulbs go off when we're having this conversation initially with um, our, our IT partners. And they realize that the management of the license to a specific user yeah. is such an enormous benefit in just in terms of overhead and compliance, that they're like, hook me up, right? I want to do this now. Yeah. How fast can we go? They want to know. Yeah. Well, when I shared this session on LinkedIn, I said something about, you know, are you still managing Adobe serial numbers in, in spreadsheets? Like, stop the madness, yeah, right? Stop <laughs> it's like, we, we, get, we get used to things. Things are comfortable. It's this true. is how we've done it for years or in maybe decades. Um, so, leaving something that's comfortable can be hard. We've all been through those things. But then when you step back and look at it, you're like, that's kind of a crazy process. What if I don't have to do that anymore? Let's talk about spreadsheets for a moment, though, because that's Please. an interesting <laughs> transition. Yeah. Um, we used to manage serial numbers. You'd, you'd buy your software products. There would be a number of serial numbers. You'd buy them onesie, twosie. You'd mm -hmm. add them to the spreadsheet and so on. Yep. Today, when we think about spreadsheets and user management, it's about now I've got a user that I might have on a spreadsheet and I have some products or groups I want to align them with. Mm -hmm. And the Adobe Admin Console does have a model that lets you upload spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. However, if I've got more than a handful of users, that can become unmanageable. 
Depends um, on the size of your hand. Depends on the size. How many? How many? I've got pretty big hands, but <laughs> like a hundred. Is it fifty? Is it a hundred people? It's about a hundred. Is about the break point. And this is anecdotally okay. talking with customers. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's no limit. It's not like we have a a, a, a limit of users that you can upload through a CSV slash spreadsheet upload. Yeah. But it's typically about a hundred is where you start to see a loss of efficiency. Yeah. Also, if you have an organization that changes a lot, think right. about like yeah. an agency where people are moving all the time. Or education. Or education where people are Students moving Students graduating. Time. Oh my goodness yeah. gracious. And yeah. you have to do that through a spreadsheet upload. Who's managing the spreadsheet? How do you get that spreadsheet? I've got you know 25,000 students that are leaving this quarter. I've got to replace them with 25,000 new fresh people. What am I going to do about that? Yeah. And you have to automate that process to make it work. So that's your user sync tool. So when I think about the user sync tool, I, you know, my one sentence is it automates onboarding and offboarding yeah. mm -hmm. of users, right? right? Right. And the offboarding is important because well, and some, licenses. And yeah. licenses. Yes. But if because if someone leaves your organization, right? You can reclaim that license right away. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. The license used to be attached to the software itself when we, you know, back in the serial number days. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, IT's building these packages of deployment, Casper, or SCCM, whatever they're going to do. Today, there's no license attached. So you can add a user or deallocate a user very easily using the uh, admin console. And then it, user sync, you can do it at scale. So that example that we mentioned before, with taking you know all of the graduating seniors out, that's very common use case for education. Um, we also see though in corporate America where a division might move from one place to another, or a whole group of people might um, mm -hmm. you know suddenly not exist because the company direction is changing. So that's a case where we can instantly deprovision those users to licenses, but retain the licenses, and this is critical. Now I've got those licenses back. They're not attached to people. Mm -hmm. I can attach them to new people because we've decided we're going to move this organization, you know, overseas, or we're going to move it to another plant, and we need mm -hmm. to deallocate those licenses. And we can do that pretty easily um, through automation, and then uh, generally with the user, uh, yeah. with the user management console. Yeah. Admin console. I'm glad you guys brought this up because if I'm in an IT role and I'm and I haven't done this project yet, but I'm thinking about, okay, Adobe has this new licensing change. The first thing I'm thinking about is the onboarding. Like, how do I get through this? And that's the first obvious question. But I think there is a more important question is, doing it one time, that's kind of easy. Managing it, keeping it up to date, dealing with people who leave the organization or change roles, that's, that's trickier. So actually, I'm going to point to you, Kevin, because so like back in the day with serial numbers, what would you guys do in that situation? Some, somebody leaves or whatever. It was very do do? manual. Um, okay. Back then, we would have to go through this same way in education. We would have to go to the actual machine, deauthorize the machine, reclaim that serial number, uninstall at times the, the software, software. Yeah. and then go to another machine and reinstall it, reauthorize it with the serial number, and then go from there. Yeah. So, so a very, very physical, like, I'm at this computer. Moving. Yeah. Yep. So do a compare and contrast, James. What's that look like in the admin console? So in the admin console world, um, I have a user that's in the admin console. They're entitled to create a cloud all apps plan. Mm -hmm. um, I remove them from that group. Done. We're yep. finished. It, it, that's it. And so you like I did not ever have to go to the computer. Yep. I didn't have to go and talk to the user. I just took them out of the group and they no longer have access to software. That's it. That sounds better. It is. <laughs> Much. So, so let's let's do another compare and contrast. So, Kevin, I know at your organization between Creative and Acrobat, you guys have a couple hundred users. Mm -hmm. um, what's mm -hmm. a what? Stretch us to the other end of the spectrum, James. What's a big, big customer that you've dealt with in terms of scale? We have a few that we've dealt with that have over a hundred thousand users. Okay. Right, and we know that there's an upper limit. For the console, just a, a software limit. It's not a, a, a limit that is functional. We've dis we decided this is going to be our top end. It's around 150,000 users at any one time. Okay. Um, so we've had uh, just recently, last week, we brought on over 100,000 users at one large organization. Mm -hmm. uh, those are document cloud users. And so they're, it took them about six hours to get them into the console and hooked up with their licenses, so that was great. So provision software to 100,000 plus users mm -hmm. in six hours. Yeah. That's now, cool. Now, we'll, we'll be very careful about that. Mm -hmm. That is about assigning the license to the user so right. that when that user actually 
double clicks on Acrobat mm -hmm. that has been deployed silently by SCCM yeah. to their desktop, right. they now have to sign in and use the software, right? So, it's that piece. Yeah. so it's a two part. Mm -hmm. There's the license assignment, which is living in the admin console, but the actual deployment of software is still gonna happen the same way it always has with those packages being deployed through Casper, SCCM, or some other yeah. enterprise. Deployment. But they're but they're abstracted from the licensing. Yes. There's no serial number baked in no there anymore. anymore. They get the software, they get the bits, uh, but then the licensing is cloud-based, and that's what the admin console yeah, And that also gives the end user a lot of flexibility, where they can sign out, and mm -hmm. they can go to another workstation, sign in, and their stuff is there, which is yeah. great. Mm -hmm. um, we see that a lot in corporate America, where people are in, they're no longer assigned to desks. They're sitting in these flexible workstations that need to be able to sit down and work where they are, so yep. they can sign in and, and they can use the software. Cool. So, so I, I called out the numbers because I think it's interesting. Like a smaller company, still hundreds of seats, mm -hmm. to hundred thousand plus. We're talking six figures, and you guys do this for a lot of customers. So yes. you you you've seen millions of seats assigned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pretty yes. huge. Millions. <laughs> yeah. So huge scale. <laughs> yeah. So huge scale. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. His KPIs are in the millions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, given what you've seen, mm -hmm. big customers, all different kinds of customers. What would you call out as some best practices that you would want our audience to know as they think about this project, mm -hmm. as they plan ahead, where do they start? Yeah, definitely planning, I think, is, is job zero here. Okay. Um, look at what your users want to do and how they would access the different features and functions that are available to them. Kevin talked about turning off or turning on type kit, for mm -hmm. instance. That's a configuration you can apply to what we call a product profile in the um, in the console, so you have a product, it's got a whole bunch of options, those can be adjusted. Mm -hmm. You make a profile of that that has the adjustments in it. That profile can be attached then to a group. The users get stuck in the group, they get that configuration. Mm -hmm. right? That's how that works. But you need to think about what does that look like? And a lot of times we'll get customers who immediately go to the deployment, but then they get stopped because they've put all their users into the console not where they need to be. And so we'll back them out and put them back in the right place. Through automation, we can do that pretty easily, but mm -hmm. it, it's a step that could be avoided if um, everybody thought a little bit, a little, little right. more about what that alignment So kind of, what do you want to give to who? What do you want to give to who? Yeah. Make groups that make sense. Names should make sense as to mm -hmm. what they are. A group called ABQ49 is not <laughs> going to help anybody downstream. Yeah. Right? Document your process. That's another thing that, okay. that we found. Um, we do, and we make available to all of our customers free of charge, uh, all of our documentation. Yeah. Um, but definitely document your process. Um, start the change request early. So okay. a lot of organizations have IT change request processes that must be followed. And this is potentially a big change where we're asking customers to um, change a process that they knew about and have been using for you know a decade or more. Um, so start that process. If they're going to implement user sync tool, for instance, and we encourage everybody to do that, um, <laughs> we want user sync or user sync tool lives behind the firewall in the organization, typically in a virtual machine. Now we've just added a level of complexity because we have to spin up that virtual machine. Is there a license attached to that and so on? Might be some costs attached to that. So want to make sure that that ball gets rolling. Do your security review. If you have to do a security review because this is new, um, start that early. And we have folks that can help with all of those, the, the planning, the software implementation piece, um, the infrastructural components and helping to define that, as well as security conversation. We yeah. can you know, help with all of that. Yeah. So um, what about who needs to be involved? Like, is this a one, one person show yeah. or? It's interesting you say that. The fastest mm -hmm. deployments we have done for user sync tool, two hours, one person. Okay. Right. So one person can do it. So are you up to it? Are you up to it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, a good question. that's that's my challenge to you. Are you um, enabled to do it? <laughs> yeah, that's more important. Well, we'll talk about enabling in a second. But yeah, uh, it can go very fast. There are a few organizations that are as uh, de-structured, deregulated as that internally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So the real situation is you're going to have to have the person who deals with software deployment actual fits to the end user. Okay. The person who's in charge of identity management, the person mm -hmm. who's in charge of the single sign-on environment, which is often different. Mm -hmm. Someone who's going to be involved in infrastructure because you're going to stand up this virtual machine somewhere. Right? Yep. So those four people are your kind of primary IT people, yeah. but do not leave out of the conversation 
the person who's dealing with the creatives day to day, okay. or the knowledge workers who are gonna be using the software, yeah. because you don't want them to be blindsided by a change and suddenly, oh my goodness, what, what's the signing thing? We don't know what this means. Right. That's, that's great. So I, actually, I've got a question from the live audience that yeah. we're gonna hit on two things. So Kevin, I'm gonna go to you from the customer great. perspective. Um, James, you talked about this process, like there's some planning, I gotta get the right people in place and so on. And then I also hear you say, some people did the, the final, the actual work in like two hours yeah. or a weekend, right? I've heard of customers that rolled out thousands of seats in a weekend, done, right? So it can be quick. Yes. In, Kevin, in your experience, what's the balance of like planning versus doing? Which one's longer? How does that, how does that work? is definitely longer. Okay. Um, depends on the size of the organization, of the infrastructure and the IT structure yep. for us. Um, since it was new, we were going from standard install uh, with standard licensing to the enterprise level. There was a lot of other moving parts that we had to consider with security and mm -hmm. infrastructure and things like that. So the planning definitely pays off mm -hmm. because it made the deployment much faster okay. than not spending as much time on the planning and meeting in person with your Adobe rep and the team, working out all the potential hazards or things like that. Because one thing you don't want to have happen is when you go to deployment, suddenly there's a blind, you're blindsided by something and that derails the whole thing. Yep. The more planning you do, the smoother your deployment's going to be. Yeah, totally. So, and on the topic of smooth deployment, one of the questions that came in that's great is, what's the transition <laughs> for end users when migrating to name user deployment? So we're talking about behind the scenes, what it takes to make it happen. But if I work in an organization mm -hmm. that makes this change, I go home for the weekend, I come back Monday, what happens? Well, they double click on Acrobat okay. and it says, hey, sign in. Now, yep. Depending on how you've set that up, it might say sign into your organization, right? So you type in uh, James Lockman at adobe.com and it says, mm -hmm. oh, you're in a SSO managed organization. So here's your IDP, your, um, your identity provider window. In our case, it's Okta. That's not a secret. It's Okta. And I now have to sign in with Okta. It will do whatever it does. I we yeah. use two-factor, which is a lot of customers use, and yeah. that's great. And then I use my software. So how do you prepare your end user for that? There's a couple of things you should do. First, in the admin console, you can provision your users ahead of time. But I encourage you to disable notifications. Yeah. This is something that uh, we have on um, by default, and we want to make sure what, what I'm giving you good advice right now shut off those notifications that come from the admin console that say you've been provisioned to this new thing because that's going to lead to confusion yeah mm -hmm. and i key helped us cause yeah <laughs> yes. IT helped us. So what, what did i get yeah what you can why? add users way in advance but yeah. not activate them essentially by yeah. not telling the user that they have to sign in so now you've got all the users in they've got software license you inform your community we're going to make a change on april 9th this is the day where it's going to happen and on this day, you're going to need to sign in. So we have, um, actually, we have some templates that we provide to customers as well to help with that communication. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you wire everything up. You wire everything up. And then throw the switch. Idling, and the switch that gets thrown is when you actually take away the serial number. Okay. So there's a, an IT step where you have to run the deserialization tool on all those machines. It's going to take the serial number away. The next time they start the software, yeah. then it will ask the And so I want to clarify something. You said take the serial number away, not the software. Not the software. Software the so stays where it is. Software is the same regardless of the licensing mechanism, yep. exactly. which is having that abstracted, I think is really important. So right. you do this really quick lightweight thing where you take out the serial number mm -hmm. and then they log in. You're not, you don't have to pull and push whole new versions. Right. And in the case of Acrobat, uh, an interesting thing will happen. It's likely that Acrobat will suddenly have more capabilities than it had before mm -hmm. when you log in rather than with the serial number, right? Creative Cloud, Things will stay mostly the same. Um, you didn't have libraries before. You didn't obviously didn't have cloud storage before. And type some of the other services, TypeKit fonts, yeah. but you'll have that, which is fantastic. So, you know, you talked about deployment. And, um, you know, when I talk to IT organizations, I always ask, do you have any IT workload reduction initiatives? Everybody does, Everybody right? Does, right? Right. So, um, one thing to think about is, and this is specific to Creative Cloud, it's a lot to package, right? Mm -hmm. How much is a whole package, like 22 gigabytes, it's pretty, it's pretty yeah. a lot of it. So one question I like to ask IT organizations is, do you, what if you could get out of that business? What if you didn't have to package anymore? Now, some organizations, I think you do, have dependencies. You might have a PIM, you might have a DAM that requires a very specific version of Creative Cloud. But if you don't, we do offer self-service options. Yeah. 
So even for non-admin users, you can push down just a little Creative Cloud app, and then you can let users, non-admin users, install their own. Right. It's awesome. And, and that way, if somebody just needs Photoshop and Illustrator, they get that. Or if they've been doing some tests, but then they're like, oh, wait, I need this new project. I'm going to do a video thing, and I need to learn Premiere. They just click. They can turn that on. And they self-service. They get what they want. And that's, you know, there's no help ticket. There's no support request. They manage yeah. themselves. Not, not for everybody, but it can be a, well, and an this awesome is great thing. in education. Yeah, I mean, very, very specifically in education, like every faculty member can like, hey, here's what you do. I, I've enabled you. Go here. Click on this link. You could, you're an admin or a non-admin. You can download on your own. Even for non-admins, we pushed yeah. on a small little application, and then they can push down the rest of it. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. And uh, it's important to note, too, for our IT audience, you know, thinking about version control and making sure that the versions don't get out of sync with our mm -hmm. extensions. Um, IT can control what versions are available mm -hmm. in that self-service model. So it might say you install Photoshop, it's only gonna allow Photoshop up to the point that you wanna make available to the to your end users in the organization. So we're giving you as much control as we can give you to make it easy for your end users to get the software that they need, but also for you as the IT professional to ensure that there's no disruption in service for the end user because they've gone beyond a certain point um, that we've decided we're going to lock down. At, yeah, you know, not ready for it. Yeah, something else to think about is, I always ask IT, do you really need to control that? Because every time you control something, it costs you time and money, Yeah. right? So I'll have, I'll have, ask IT folks, why do you do that? Sometimes the answer is, well, we've kind of always done we've that, always that done much, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. the other thing is, uh, there's a user that needs an older version of one system, so we're going to keep everyone on that version. I'm like, well, what if you could just allow the people who need that older version to install that on their own, or the legend versions we call them? Yeah. They can even do that through self-service. I think that's a good point, too, in that Creative Cloud licensing allows you to install previous versions of software and have them resident. Same, mm -hmm. same software, but different yeah. versions on the same computer. So if you do have someone who needs a legacy version, they can have it available yeah. and they can self-service install it as well. Yeah, so you need CS6 for that one yeah. weird automation thing you have. They, the three people out of your thousand that need that can do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, I've got a question from Kenneth um, that's interesting. He's asking, with some of the new apps, and I'll fill in, uh, for example, like Adobe XD and Adobe Dimension, um, these, these are newer apps from Adobe. We're not even putting serialization technology in there, right? right. It's like old technology. We've been moving away from this for six years, so we're not going to inject the old stuff in the new. So those apps only support name user licensing. Um, in that case, because they don't have a serialized option, how does education, uh, how would an education customer handle that for especially like lab environments and students? Yeah, so today um, for those particular software um, packages, they would need to, the users are gonna have to sign in, they're just gonna have to yeah. do it. So, so for like a student, like if I'm a student with a laptop, mm -hmm. no problem. No problem, because I'm doing it on my own. Yeah. And assuming that the institution has made Creative Cloud available to you, and many, I want to say a, a large number of our customers today are opting for what we call an all-in, where all the students, all the faculty, all the staff are covered under the Creative Cloud license. Mm -hmm. In that case, sure, every student, they sign in with their enterprise ID or their uh, SSO credentials at the university, they have access to software as they need it. Because we can assign a license to a person and, and remove the license from the person, it gives the institution great flexibility in, in terms of assigning licenses when necessary. So if someone needs to have access to Photoshop for a class or say the video tools for a class, they can do that yep. uh, through automation. But lab's different. Lab is different. So right. in the lab case, and we're seeing fewer and fewer labs getting spun up these days. So, yeah. you know, as we're looking out at the way that uh, schools are deploying software, fewer and fewer are making investments in labs. So there's older labs that are eventually retiring from hard, the hardware will retire mm -hmm. and that will be the end of the lab. Um, today, you have to have serial numbers to operate those machines without named user, which means that Dimension and XD are not going to be part of the conversation there. So they're going to have to bring their laptop uh, or deploy the software and the user is going to have to sign in to that yeah. machine to use it. Yeah. We'd strongly encourage laptops yeah. um, for that. Mm -hmm. In the future, which is not too far away, Adam talked earlier about changes that we're going to be making um, and long around max, somewhere yeah. around that time frame, um, that will include uh, licensing chains that won't have serial numbers. That's going to also include some benefits for 
customers like education where we'll have a lab model that will have the license embedded in the software. So the license is always there, but the user is going to have to sign in. And the user will sign in, use what, whether they're Adobe title to or that they've created elsewhere. So that will be a benefit there. They'll sign out. The license is still there. So whether a student, let's say a, a student doesn't have access to all of Creative Cloud, when they're on that machine, they can use the software, which is great. And they can also access their libraries and so on that they might have created yep. you know, while they're there. And when they leave and they go home, they won't have access to the software unless they're entitled to use it. So that's for labs. We're also looking at some other use cases, particularly um, disconnected machines in government, in media producers. We say government, federal government, yeah. uh, defense department type of applications, yeah. um, financial services and so on that have um, very strong uh, security requirements and require completely disconnected systems. And so yeah. we're developing some solutions around that that can move the licensing from today where we're, we're pinging Adobe to make sure that the license is valid. We can redirect that to a an IT managed mm -hmm. license server that's going to be able to do that. Yeah. So by end of 2018, end of 2018, we should have that. Things will be in place. Super. Awesome. Uh, that sounds good. That's really helpful. Um, and hopefully helpful to Kenneth. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, James, one other question for you. Um, we've talked about this project. We've talked about some best practices. Mm -hmm. um, people are hearing about like the impending need, like you know, serial numbers are going away, so I need to make this change by the end of the year. Um, and, you know, if I want to take advantage of new apps, new features in, across Acrobat and Creative Cloud, by the end of the year, you'll need to be on end user licensing. Yeah. And, and again, I start, we started with a timeline um, to say, you know, we've been at this change for about five or six years. So it's not new, but it's accelerating. So what resources are available to customers to say, okay, I got to get on the bandwagon and I got to finish this project. What do we have for them, or what is your team? Uh, what's your team created to help? That's cool. Um, the, at the top level, I mentioned Adobe I/O before, mm -hmm. where we have documentation about the user management API. If you want to build your own automation solution, have at it. Yep. Documentation is very clear; uh, it's easy to use. Um, we built User Sync tool to make it super easy. You need to put that on a virtual machine. You need to configure it to talk to your LDAP. Configure it to talk to the Adobe Admin Console figure out what the uh, mapping is between the security groups in AD and the Adobe Admin Console groups and automate it and you're off to the races. That is a GitHub project that's open source. Anybody can have it and we encourage all of you to go and fetch it and start to investigate it. Yep. It's fully documented in six languages, so we're, we want this to be global. The code is open. If you want to do a security review and dig mm -hmm. into the bits and bytes, have a blast. Mm -hmm. we, we encourage it. And we also have a number of customers who are supplying um, feature requests and enhancements to us. And so we want this to be a collaboration with our IT community where they're taking advantage of the, the just the, the native collaboration of GitHub. It's unlike anything else we've done in digital media at Adobe, which is really exciting. Yeah. So there's, there's that. And it's, again, tons of documentation in the admin console, uh, sorry, in GitHub for the project. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, uh, I think that um, we're going to have posted into the chat a Spark page that kind of explains what user sync tool is and how it works. Okay. So go and take a look at that. And then from there at the bottom, there's a link to a number of resources that can take you directly into the in installation components and so on. So yeah. um, pretty easy to do. We're also adding in, in by the end of this month, so it's April now, by the end of April, we'll have some courseware available that um, IT pros can take a course and how to stand up user sync tool. We want to take what we do um, with a few customers and encapsulate that knowledge into a course that anybody can take and deploy that user sync tool following our best practices that we bring to meetings with yep. customers. Yep. And the price on the training? That would be the very high price of zero. Okay. Zero. <laughs> cool. That's great. So end of month, end of April. And user sync tool is also zero. <laughs> we like that. We like free. So the, so the sync tool and the documentation available now. Available for today. It's been available for over a year. And the courseware coming by the end of April. By the end of April. Yeah. Okay. Super. That sounds good. A um, couple of other, uh, actually another question that came in. Um, and I'm just reading through it here. It says, is it possible to achieve the self-surface functionality 
without downloading the packages. So I'm not quite sure if I if I quite understand the question, but yeah. maybe you guys can I can probably take that. Yeah. So there's two types of users, right? Admin users, non admin users. Like on their computer. On user. their computer. So yeah. if you're an admin on your computer mm -hmm. using IT or can say go to Adobe, download the Creative Cloud application, and go to town. Right? They log in and they can install stuff. If yeah. they're a non-admin, you do have to push down a much smaller package, which is just the Creative Cloud application. You package that up. You can easily create a package with like one click from the admin console, mm -hmm. really easy. And you would need to push that down using the tool of your choice, SEM, Camper, uh, uh, Casper, whatever you have. Yeah. So it just, you really have to know whether they're an admin or not. If, if they're, everyone's an admin, your job is super simple. Yeah. You've got almost nothing to do, yeah. which is great. I love that. And, and so even if not, they are an admin, yeah. you can enable it for deploying software as if it were an admin. So once you get that small package, that Creative Cloud Desktop yeah. app onto the computer, then the user can self-select with the privileges that have been applied when we install yeah. that, right. that one little piece. Yeah. And if you're not familiar with that elevated privileges concept, what that means is they can install and update their Adobe apps, Correct. but it doesn't unlock anything else. They're not right. going to go install crazy stuff that you don't want them to. Kind of this little safe sandbox. Here's the Adobe stuff. Everything else, you're not an admin. Exactly. It's just and that does apply to today the Creative Cloud applications and um, Acrobat Professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which So one thing is that that I think is interesting to note, as I mentioned before, but if you can give up a little control as IT, mm -hmm. it can save you a lot of time. This is yeah. one of those examples you have to ask yourself: Do I really need to control the versions of the apps that the users have? Am I okay? with users being smart enough mm -hmm. yeah. to know what they need. So I remember I one very sage IT guy who said, if I do this for you, you're not going to call me anymore. You are now in control of your apps, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. This wasn't a huge creative group, right? Yeah. But he goes, you're in control of this. Like, I mean, if you can't install, I'll help you. But now you have to know what's compatible. Yeah. And so I tend to think creatives are pretty smart. You know, they, they're problem solvers. They usually yeah. figure it out, especially within their work groups. Yeah. So I'll, engaged. I'll talk to that for a moment. We have one customer in Europe that in, we've been following through their transition. And they were able to repurpose an IT person. The, once they made the transition to being user with Adobe software, they were able to take that IT person who was complete. All they did was either handle inbound requests for tech support or deploy software. That's all they did and move them into something that's actually making the company money as opposed to costing the company money. So that's an enormous benefit when you look at how can I repurpose that time right. that's being spent today on either those tech support calls or on just managing the software installs and right. uninstalls. You know, we have, Adam, we have a great white paper on this, mm -hmm. one of our yeah. FIFA reports yeah. that covers named user deployment yeah. and licensing, and that would be a good read for you know any of our audience out there today. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. Um, one other thing, again, I'm thinking back to the question we had earlier about the user experience. So, Kevin, in your situation, I'm curious, um, when people would log into their Creative Cloud and access a service or whatever, is that something that was familiar to them? Like, or like, was it foreign or was it familiar? Like, because they were already logging into other stuff in the organization. It was, it was somewhat familiar. Um, a few of our users actually have their own individual Creative Cloud accounts at home. Okay. Um, so they were familiar with the, the concept of signing into the software. Yeah. Um, for a few people, it's a little bit foreign, um, especially when they, you know, if they had lapsed a little bit and had yeah. to sign back in. Um, you know, we get that question whether I have to sign back in, yeah. you know, occasionally. But um, it, it went over pretty smooth. It wasn't something that they were like, why, why do I have to do this? You know, or there wasn't any pushback um, as far as signing in for the first time. They, they recognized, and part of that was education too. We kind of told them what they were getting sure. and the benefits they were getting by doing this. Yep. So the, the trade-off was minimal. Okay. So. And it's not like they haven't logged into like SharePoint and Facebook and Slack right. and Office and like whatever exactly. else they're using. So exactly. it's kind of a new norm for right. all of us. And I, I think that's also kind of one of those misconceptions. You don't have to log in all the time. You right. can actually be offline for up to mm -hmm. 99 days. Right. With it, so I, with the word I use with the logins is like benign, like the first, after the first time you sell them, if ever you need to log in. Yeah, right. I can't. I've been using Creative Cloud for Enterprise for six years, and I cannot remember the last time I logged in. It's just, I'm like always, yeah, yeah. And yet, like when I took the train down to the city, I'm like working, working. I'm not online, and right. I'm working in Photoshop and InDesign, and um, so that's a good reminder. That's helpful. Super cool. 
Um, and, and the other, I've just got a few reminders of some resources and stuff that I want to end with uh, before we're out of time. But any other kind of final thoughts or suggestions or anything you guys want to offer? Let's make it happen. You know, yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes, I think one thing I've heard from customers that like they sometimes what you think something's going to be is worse than what it really is, it's right? Yeah. So I found that after we explain, okay, this is what you're going to do, they're like, really, that's kind of it. Yeah. Technically, it's not that hard. I think uh, to your point, James, you need the right. Your, you need to get your stakeholders yes. on board. So make sure you talk individually with each stakeholder. Right. Tell them why we're doing it, why it's important to the organization, before you call everyone to a meeting and announce that you're going to do it. So some of it's a stylistic thing yeah. for many organizations, mm -hmm. and you have to use some, for lack of a better term, some salesmanship and IT yeah. to make it happen sometimes. But technically, it's not that hard. I mean. We have customers who do it over a weekend, a couple yeah. of days. You're a two-hour guy, two hours. exception. But, uh, but for some organizations, if it if your process is longer, you know you have a lot of compliance issues. Map it out. But we have a spreadsheet available for this. You can use to yeah. help help uh, your own pro process and go for it. Yeah, super. Um, we're happy. Um, that's the big thing. Yeah, you know, we're enjoying the benefits of the admin console and having thing everyone under unified control. Um, we're looking forward to migrating over to SSO and having that be automated a yeah. little bit more. Yeah. And uh, also looking forward to uh, upgrading the next version of Creative Cloud when it comes out. Super. Cool. Excellent. And we're looking forward to helping out New Line make that transition over thank to you. Uh, yeah. Federated ID. Yeah. Super. Very cool. Well, we're, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate yeah. the conversation, yeah. Kevin. We appreciate you coming down. Thank you for having me. So very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, so as we wrap up, I just want to mention a couple of resources, uh, and we are going to uh, make sure that those links are available uh, in the chat stream. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes here and remind you uh, that we do have an IT, an Adobe IT newsletter. So we hope this uh, session has been helpful, but we want to stay in touch with you and make sure you're staying abreast of the latest and greatest. Um, and so make sure you subscribe to that IT newsletter. Uh, we It's not too frequent, uh, but we put the best of in uh in there, and I think that'll be helpful. Uh, another resource is a self-help resource. It's called the IT Learning Hub. Uh, this is an online web portal full of all of the latest and greatest, um, you know, white papers. Some of the things that Rick mentioned: uh, productivity reports, how-to guides, best practice guides, uh, even links to you know webinars and sessions like this uh, that I think will be really helpful. So check out the IT Learning Hub. And the third thing is, in addition to those resources, if this is a project that you haven't taken on yet, or maybe you started but haven't finished. My encouragement to you would be to connect with your uh, local Adobe team, uh, connect with them, find out the right uh, resources and timelines to finish this project and uh, and get everybody transitioned. Again, uh, October 2018 will be a pivotal time for Adobe, where across Creative Cloud and Document Cloud and Acrobat, if you want to take advantage of those latest uh, apps and new features, you'll need to be on name user licensing. So we want you to be ready for that. So with that, uh, thank you a ton for joining us. Uh, again, stay tuned uh, for future updates. We want to do these regularly, and we're really grateful that you joined us. Have a great day.